As my intro music finally pops out the end and I work over the top of that, I'd like to welcome you back to AMSC or Anthony Morrissey Sports Consultancy Commercialization of Sports Series. Hope you're all doing quite well. It's lovely and warm here in Sweden and my son is about to run in the door, which is all part of the joys of September. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by my guests coming up soon, who for me, I've known way, way back when I used to work at Munster Rugby. Um, and the joy of watching him run out under the field um, and also as somebody who who had an accent that wasn't necessarily from Limerick or Cork as well that would have been something that would have been interesting but also following his journey then from that into business and into his role now uh, connected with Titan Wellness um, and how that's grown and a really fascinating conversation I believe coming up about where he sees the future of sport but also his journey to get to this point so I'll, by, by all means I'll bring him in vault. Now Ronan how are you doing my good man? Anthony, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Not a bother at all. It's fantastic to have you to have you here and and involved. And again, from my perspective, having been a, a monster fan all my life, um, it's great to have somebody who's also got the the monster passion. I remember speaking to you in my in my previous role, and the passion for monster rugby drips out of you. But before we get into that conversation, when you were originally starting out as Little Noel Ronan, what was your uh, where was your passion of sport come from? Um. To be honest with you, rugby wasn't my passion when I was younger. <laughs> I did. I was kind of only kind of introduced to rugby um, in terms of you can be professional later in my teenage years. But I played a lot of Gaelic football when I was younger. I did play rugby like once a week uh, or whenever the Gaelic wasn't on. I'd play rugby, uh, but Gaelic football was my passion. Playing sport, uh, you know, in in Ireland, Gaelic football is huge and County Mead. 20 30 years ago were the best team in the land so my dream was to play for them so that's where my love for sport began and then it grew then when I played more rugby and uh, I obviously a big Man United fan as well uh, we won't talk about that at the moment they're struggling at the moment but well, we still support them you know <laughs> yeah I think from from my perspective uh, I remember as a kid being like my father used to close the curtains when any of the big games are on and I'm from Cork originally so I very very remember the Cork Mead stuff in the 1980s and, and the end of that so I, I, I could stand aside anyone that watches Gaelic football now mightn't see Mead as, as a massive juggernaut but trust me when Colm O'Rourke was playing and guys like that it was yeah. one of those juggernauts but from yourself from, from playing wise is what what was the kind of memories you would have of your younger days going to sport? Was there any particular games? I know you said going to me games. Would it be going to Croker back in the day, or would it be local games? Or what was your memory of, of attending sport? And games? Yeah, the biggest memory would be um, playing with my dad's team. who coached the Gaelic football uh, from the age of maybe twelve till like, till nineteen until I went back to when I went to play rugby. So uh, just going to games with my family and my friends, and um, you know. You did friends that you went to school with and childhood friends for the rest of your life they're the greatest memories i have about sport you know like it was great to play professional sport but to be playing with your mates that you grew up with and they you know the stories and the experiences and in fairness we won a lot in, in my club St. Colin kills over the years so it was a successful time as well so uh, they're probably my best memories but i do have a great memories going to crow park beating the dubs as well which was good the role of us now at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think I think from from anyone anyone not living in Ireland that's listening to this, it's a bit like if you if people are listening in Sweden, it's like taking on a Stockholm team. Um, Dublin would be one of those ones that every other county in the country would like to see them get beaten by by some other county. So I fully I fully endorse that conversation. From your perspective, then going into professional sport um, and the expectation you would have gone to go into it, I'm assuming you would would you have gone through the academy route or was it something you would have gone directly into into Lancer? Yeah, I was in the National Academy, so uh, a long time ago now, it was uh, I, I RFU, Ireland Academy, now it's provincial now, uh, so I was in that for two years, um, and then I got my first contract with Leinster Rugby, and I was there for four years, so that's, yeah, I was in the academy, the, the kind of the, the National Academy, it was called at the time. Yeah, and when you were when you were playing professionally then, because you went on and signed for Munster and, and, and did all those things, from a commercial perspective, when you were involved in the game and, and as a player and you were so engrossed in what was going on in the game, was there ever a situation where you were asked to do commercial things that you thought impacted you? Or how did you prefer to get spoken to by a commercial department? Or how would you advise people to speak to their players commercially? 
Um, I suppose back then it was, it was only rugby was only growing. I suppose I've more experience the older I got over time. But uh, I would like support from uh, people before I did it. That would have been, and in fairness, the Irish Rugby Football Association have support there in place. But getting support and, and a bit of upskilling on how to speak to the public uh, would be the first tip I give. And then um, not not putting someone in their out of the comfort zone, especially when they're young, you know. So give them a topic they can they're easy to speak about and they can cover. I think they're the two bits of advice I'd give on that. And did you feel comfortable um, when it came to the scenario of, of speaking with with brands or with other people, whether that was working for Munster or Leinster, or even when you finished playing? Did, was it was that the, the comfort zone you speak about to try and keep in that, or or would you would you prefer to like literally dump and go? Let's go. Let's see what I can do. Uh, yeah, it was. It was like the older I got, the better I got at it. Speaking, you know, doing an interview, or you know, if there's a photo shoot and or, or video shoot, or whatever it may be, uh, I learned from my mistakes. Let's put it that way. But if I was upskilled better when I was younger, uh, as I said, there's stuff in place now for professional athletes. But um, I look back at some of my videos and I kind of learned that I need to get better. So uh, having a bit of experience, education on that. Um, then you, you, I think most athletes are comfortable speaking in front of the, the public now or in front of the camera or whatever it may be. Yeah, I, I find it funny if, if you were to go back to look at, I do a, an NFL podcast, if you went back to the first NFL podcast I did to now, I'd, I'd, I'd cringe in the corner and look at what I, how badly I can do things. Yeah. Um, is there a memory for you of a moment on the field or off the field um, that, that stands out from your sporting professional career? Is there one moment that you're going, yeah, whether that's a try, whether that's a moment with the stadium, whether that's a moment with your friends, was there, was there any one moment that you can look back on and go, that's the one? There's one uh, moment that will never beat any other moment. Uh, it was Munster versus the All Blacks in 2008. So the All Blacks had a touring squad over and we played in the home park. I'd say you were there, were you there? I was, I was. Um, I'll never forget that day. It was one of the biggest uh, games I've ever uh, p- played a role in. Like I remember you, we, we'd stay in the Clarion Hotel, which is a few, kind of maybe a couple of miles away from the stadium. And we go down to Shelburne Road, and normally on match day, it wouldn't be that busy because we're there an hour and a half before kickoff. People would get there a bit later, but this day I'll never forget the thousands of people on the streets ready to go. And for some reason, there was um, no barrier in terms of security when we were getting our bikes, and there was grown men shouting and roaring. And I was like, "This is a big deal tonight." I, I, and then when we went onto the field and. Uh, the All Blacks did a hack it, and then we did a hack it. Well, our Kiwi players did a hack it back. I've never felt atmosphere uh, like that in ever in any stadium I've ever played in. And uh, we played well enough, and unfortunately, we lost uh, with three or four minutes to go. But if you could bottle that atmosphere and that experience, and obviously playing against the world's greatest team and nearly beating them, it was one of the best moments I can remember. Anyway. Yeah, we won't we won't talk about Maffy jumping the line in the last couple of minutes. We uh, promise promise you won't say to mention that. Um, yeah, I, I think I think what makes that special though is as you said, and I've, I've asked that question to, to non athletes as well about their experience in sport and, and athletes too. And what I find interesting is your comment about going down to Shelburne Road and having that feeling. You didn't you didn't mention Barry Murphy's try. You didn't mention about any of the tackles. It was the feeling and the passion and the moments you felt uh, yeah. before you went out to the field. The, 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 the monster special of it, it's the people. It's the, your teammates, obviously, and management, but supporters and the people of the Munster region, they're special. So, like, you, you always remember that connection with them. I'm sure they made the atmosphere on the night. So that was the standout moment for me. Obviously, we played a game of rugby against the top team, but just being part of that was that was one of the moments that I'll never forget. And and you said about the hacker and, and the famous monster hacker. And I advise anyone that's that's hasn't seen it go onto YouTube and look at it. It's, it's quite impressive. But for someone that's, that's standing and, and listening to the hacker all through your life and seeing it on TV and all that kind of stuff, to talk to someone now who's actually experienced it on the other side, what's the feeling going through your head when you're when you're watching it? If for me, it motivated me. Obviously, the, the the New Zealand guys are big boys and they're good at rugby, but. I was ready to play. That was my, it was kind of I'm ready for a battle if you get me. Um, and I think most of the lads felt that. But um, it's definitely inspiring and motivating, and uh, I'm sure it's the same for them. But uh, it was it was great that I faced it. I actually faced it again when I played for Ireland against the New Zealand Mary team, and it was their 50, 50 year anniversary, and we were on tour. And that you should, you should have a look at that one. And, on YouTube, that's a better hacker. I've never seen a hacker like it. it. Was just a bespoke one for that 50th anniversary. Wow! 
and uh, that was another incredible experience. But it, it motivates you. And um, when you're playing the best team in the world, you want to try and beat them. You know what I mean? Uh, it <laughs> and then you finish up finish up playing rugby um and it comes to an end and and i remember talking to marcus horan previously about the, the feeling after after you finished up and the first week was where you do interviews or you talk to family and you're, you, you're brought out and all those kind of things and then you have to sit down on a monday and realize you're in your 30s and you're retired um and what do you do next from your from your own perspective had you started that conversation in your head before you finished up or was it a case of when you'd finished up you were like okay now what am i going to do yeah i was lucky enough I, I was so um, in Ireland, the, the Irish Rugby Football Association have like, like a union, so represented to support you with the transition. There's your ba- child in the background. And now he's gone mad. He's gone mad. He, yeah, as soon as, soon, as he, as soon as he heard about retirement, he was straight on there. Yeah, I know the headache, but um, yeah. So they, they just, there were supports and people helping me from transitioning um, for life after rugby. So I had a mentor that I was working with, and I was also I was kind of representative for the the Munster players in Limerick at the same time when I got injured. So I was fairly um, ready to for retirement whenever that may be. I wanted to play for a couple of few more years, but obviously that was cut short. But I had a plan. I was in college, um, and I had planned that I was going to open up my own gym and coach rugby because that's what I was qualified in. And it was easy transition. So uh, I had a plan. And unfortunately, my career ended probably two or three years before I wanted it to end. But I was ready. And uh, I'd always, the younger players, I'd always promote to do it early, have a plan after uh, life after rugby or any elite sport because you could be injured in the blink of an eye. I went training on a Thursday. I was supposed to play on a cup on a Saturday against Gloucester. And I never played rugby again in one moment so yeah you have to be planned and luckily enough I was yeah and that's a really interesting point because a lot of the players that that I was speaking to in the past have have a kind of they've got their college degree or they've got their their masters or they've got their kind of piece of paper that they have but they don't actually have an idea as to what they're going to use that for uh, or the the thought process a concept on it If, if you were to look back at yourself now would you be advising yourself to to what would sorry i'll start again what would you actually advise yourself to do if if you were sitting there age 24 25 26 you're playing in in munster leinster ulster connacht whatever team that may be and you're you've got your piece of paper that says you're qualified whatever what's the next step that you would advise them to take uh get experience so if whatever industry you want to get into um get experience and like in fairness if you're elite athlete the doors are wide open for you to get experience um and you know Every Wednesday, you might have a day off. Most athletes do on a Wednesday, midweek, do three or four hours in the, in the corporate environment or whatever environment. Uh, and I think that's the best learning curve. You'll understand the different situations and obstacles that you might face if you don't do it uh, when you do retire. So, you know, and get advice off people, ask questions. And then when you do come out, you're ready to go then. So, and I think there's there's lots of opportunities now for, for athletes in many sports in Ireland anyway. Um, and I'd highly recommend get your uh, work experience. I know your be all and the end all is to be a professional athlete and be everything, but it doesn't last forever, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think it's it's where the conversation needs to look at in sport is when we say the word retired, um, and somebody could be still in their late twenties, early thirties, and it's just the mental conversation that needs to be looked around. That so that's a separate conversation for a separate day. But then you moved in out of out of the workplace, you're off the field, and the boots are hung up, as they say. I know you did play a little bit more Gaelic football, but we we'll talk about that later on. But what's the what's the way did you then get into into Titan Wellness, and how did that how did that journey begin for you? Yeah, so I, my mentor who helped me when I was transitioning from uh, retirement in rugby, as you said, um, she recommended me to do what I like doing and what I know. So I was an athlete, so I was had a degree in strength and conditioning, a uh, fitness degree, and I could go into it, open up my own gym. So that was box ticked. I did all my coaching badges with the RFU uh, up to stage four. So I was, I was an athlete, a professional rugby player, so I kind of had a good knowledge of it. So I did them to see where that brought me. And uh, I kind of fell into the wellness industry where I was asked to do some co- corporate talks on high performance and exercise, physical well-being, nutrition, lifestyle. And I just, and not, not many people, this was maybe 10 years ago, the co- companies had no idea about what wellness was, what what collaboration was, communication, nutrition, exercise, sleep. And my job for 10 years was that, to get up, train, eat healthy, 
have fun with my teammates, work hard, have a vision, a goal, and then play every weekend. And that's what business is, in my eyes, I think. You know, we're having that working environment where you collaborate. collaborate. So I set, I set up Titan Wellness with my business partner, Paul McManus, and um, he had a background in, um, in the, he was in the guards, he was in the elite level of the guards in, in, uh, in Ireland. So the police, if you're not in uh, Ireland. <laughs> and uh, he got shot on duty and uh, he had the same qualifications as me in strength and conditioning and uh, so we both had the same mindset in terms of what we wanted to bring to the corporate world and um, that's how titan wellness formed so we we go into corporate clients nationwide and the uk and abroad uh, and we support them with workplace well-being solutions people ask me what does that mean <laughs> so yeah, i'll tell you now so basically we like to educate people on the different areas of wellness so the pillars of health would be your sleep, nutrition, mental well-being, physical well-being. But we do holistic services. We do corporate gyms. We do fitness classes, uh, talks, and all things well-being from, from uh, I don't know, Lego sessions to uh, making ice cream. So we do everything, a uh, turnkey solution for corporates in terms of uh, wellness events and solutions. So that's what we do at the moment. Yeah, well, what I find interesting about that is when I, I walked in the door into, well, it wasn't a HBC back then. It was like you had to go to the one in U, in CIT or you went to the one in LIT at the time. But yeah. I also always found it amazing that they had the stuff on the wall around sleep and around how many hours did you get and the importance that was put towards that. You mentioned there that 10 years ago when you started this up that there wasn't a lot of corporates that knew about, about wellness and what it meant and how important it was. What would you what would be when you walked in the door to some of these corporates? What was the conversation piece that you'd have towards them um, around getting them knowledgeable of how important it was? So the first step would be to actually communicate. <laughs> I would be doing talks and people in the room would need to know each other's names. And I found that crazy. You know, from coming from a team uh, environment where you kind of got to know everybody, you know, especially Munster, everyone knows everyone. You know, <laughs> Yeah, there's a bit of slagging, but you know, there's a bit of trust happens then when you get to know people, um, and that's how you work better. And so that was one thing that I'd highly recommend is get to know your colleagues, um, make an effort to do that, and that's where you build that relationship and the trust, as I said. Uh, and then physical well-being is the easiest um way to get active and communicate and socialize with people as well, and it's one of the pillars of our health. So getting groups in exercising after work or lunchtime. I think is a great way to um, you know help your well well being, and then I suppose educating them on the different areas of well being. That would they, they would be the three areas that needed to kind of support on you know. And also the big thing for me when I when I look at some brands is that they come to me and conversations are when I worked at Monster definitely they come to me saying they they want to they want to do something for their staff and they want to they want to grow their staff so that their staff doesn't leave or doesn't feel feels energetic or feels happy and they want to whether that's going out in a staff night out or whether that's doing something similar to what you said from a wellness perspective. Over the 10 years, have you seen brands understanding the importance of this more? Um, are, are you still having to have the same education conversations or communication questions at the start that you would have had 10 years ago? Oh, there's way more aware, awareness now. and It's part of their strategy. A lot of companies in health and wellbeing is part of their strategy for retention and recruitment. I'll give you a couple of examples. We have um, three or four pharmaceuticals that have their on-site gym. So we designed the gym, installed it, and then we manage it with our staff. And um, they, 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 their employees love working there. Some of them uh, are moving from one building to the other because the gym is better. But <laughs> what they're doing is it's, they're connecting straight away in the gym. They're, act, they're, they're active, they're happy, and then they don't have to go pay for another gym somewhere else or travel an hour. To, so it's helping them with productivity and the environment they're working in. So there's a huge amount of awareness now. So it's part of the company's strategies to, you know, have health and well-being as part of their recruitment and, you know, holding on to their staff as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a big conversation, especially within sponsorship elements as well. So there's a lot of CSR stuff, which would be community social yeah. responsibility. So they'd see a lot of that um, being the brands and that sometimes is where they connect into certain clubs. So from, from my perspective, I, I would have a conversation with people about their CSR projects when it comes to getting involved with sports clubs and sports connection. You're still yeah. involved with sport. Would you still consider yourself? Yeah. So sport I, yeah. So when I retired, I coached rugby for um, four years and then, I was head of strength and conditioning with the Mead Intercounty senior team for three years. And I then I coached Gaelic football last year. 
now this year I'm taking a break because I was out every night of the week nearly. <laughs> And um, we have young families, so I'm helping out my own GA club now with their kind of um, their athletic development and coaching resources to support them because we have a massive club. It's grown rapidly in the last 10 years, so I'm helping out with that and I enjoy it, but it's more flexible. And have you seen um, professionalism that would have been there when you were at Leinster and Munster? Have you seen that form into uh, GAA, which is an amateur sport at the end of it, and especially club game, which would be even more amateur based that they that they don't get the maybe the, the recognition outside of their town or their area? Would you see the professionalism at that level has increased since when you were playing? Yeah, in inter county, definitely it's that's a given in most counties in France, but in the clubs, it's getting better. Uh, I, I'd push more if I was in charge of some of the senior teams, but just in terms of analysis, stats, and um, S and C and stuff, I'd try and put it all together. But there definitely is, and I know in GA in Dublin, it's it's huge. It's done very well. Where me, a little bit behind, in my opinion. And then moving on into the future of sport and where where sport can go. Um, for me, an eye opener was the the Women's World Cup recently and and the explosion in Ireland. Um, through Sky's promotion of it, but also through now suddenly young boys and young girls have experts and and heroes to look up to that aren't necessarily Ronaldo or Messi or they're people who live around the corner from them in the case of Katie McCabe or whatever. So so for the future of sport, do you see women's sport as being the main kind of pusher, or is there another area of sport that, that you think is, is an interesting one to keep an eye on? Um, I hope uh, female sport grows because I have a daughter who is interested in plays Gaelic football and it, inclusive uh, sport like soccer and the growth of female, I think that's unreal because imagine in 10 years' time if you're a female and you're 17, you can be a professional soccer player in the Premier League and you're making good money. I think that's great, you know what I mean? Uh, women's rugby's grown as well in Ireland, so I'd push for that. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd love to see rug, rugby uh, grow more um, because we put our bodies through so much damage that we, we don't get paid enough for it, just to be plain and simple about it. But um, I know what rugby is probably wouldn't be as global as soccer you know but um i'd love to see investment into rugby because it's a great game and they put their bodies on the line every week uh, and they should get paid double they're get they're being paid at the moment but anyway I can hear the late great Gareth Fitzgerald in my head uh, yeah. disagreeing with that last comment, but I totally agree with you. I think that's that's an yeah. interesting day we're looking at. Actually, yeah. before we go any further, what did you think of of Munster finally finally winning the trophy, winning the UR series? You know, right. I was delighted. I was actually talking to a few of the boys that we would have played together in Munster over the years, and all the memories came flooding back when you, you see the lads win in South Africa. It was like, Jesus, this is a great moment, you know. And hopefully, it's it kind of the turn for the success to go upwards and win maybe Europe again, but all the memories came flooding back and I was delighted to see a few indigenous coaches uh, like Leams and Prendy there and Cosy's back. Munster, that's what Munster is built on and it wasn't like that previously over the last few years. The lads have made a huge difference, you know, so it's all good. Yeah, and, and again, looking looking at, at rugby in Ireland, we've got the Rugby World Cup coming up and, and some some big moments, but there's also some some other sports that are that are coming through. And as you said, hopefully me. I know the women's the women the ladies team in me are pretty good as well. So I think there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of future in, in in different sports. What I'm going to finish off with is is what I do is it's called a top ten quick fire. I have a feeling I know the answer to some of these, but I said I'd throw them past you. So it's the first thing that comes to your mind. All right, so we start straight away. So tea or coffee? Coffee. Netflix or the cinema? Netflix. What series are you watching right now on Netflix? Um, the Watcher. That's, that, like, the person who I did last time did that. I said that as well. I haven't done the, I haven't done the Watcher yet. Um, yeah. just, uh, the the, fa- the favourite ever stadium you've played in? Tom and Park. Great answer. Favourite ever stadium you've been in for an atmosphere? Watching. like yep. a um, Old Trafford. <laughs> I can't agree with that one. Um, you're, you're, I don't know if you know the answer. You mightn't give me an answer for this. Favourite takeaway? Takeaway would be an Indian. Best holiday destination? Portugal. Club or county? Club. Club or country? A province or country? Province or province. <laughs> <laughs> dogs or cats? Uh, dogs. If sport was to be banned tomorrow morning, and stopped for ever in a day, and no one's ever allowed to talk about it, watch it, see it. What impact would that have on your life? I wouldn't have life. 
<laughs> well, Ronan, it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. I really appreciate your time. Before you go, tell everyone where they can find out more about and Titan Wellness. Where they, where can they go to, to look up? Uh, www.titanwellness.ie and if you want to contact me, it's Niall at titanwellness.ie. Thanks very much, Anthony. Best luck. No problem at all. I'll put, you, I'll put it into the bottom of the YouTube clip as well, so, so it's there. Have a great day, my man. Appreciate your time now. Bye. Cheers, mate. That was done with Ronan. Absolutely fascinating to talk to uh, to a former player and get his experience of what it was like to move from on the field to off the field. And you can see the passion that's still there. And it, it resonates with everyone that I've spoken to is about the passion that they have. And um, whether that's for the sport they played in, whether that's the sport they're connected to, or whether it's the brand that's connected into the sport. And I think that's a really important part of what it is. Uh, he spoke really well about about wellness and, and tight wellness. So I always everyone to have a look at that and, and follow it and, and get involved because it's such an important part of, of growing your brand and growing your company is to make sure your staff are happy and make sure they're involved in it. As he said, right, well, there was people who wanted to move from one building to the other because the gym is better. And um, that's it for another episode of the AMSC series of commercialization of sport. And um, we've got a couple more guys lined up over the next few weeks. Uh, I've got my website launched in October on the day of my son's birthday uh, 16th of October so that'll all get going um, and you can get in touch with me all the details are at the bottom of the screen if you want to learn more about what I can do to help your brand help your club or help your federation in the meantime before my intro music kicks me off I'd like to say keep following the sun folks thanks very much bye bye